I heard a ringing sound, a soft bong, which let me know that I was needed at the door. It was a Friday night and we had a lot of people. Catching my bartender's eye, I headed for the door. Usually the two of us would have to work on the weekends, but that wouldn't take much time. Most likely it was an invited guest who arrived late. I would check to see if he was on the list, let him into the lobby and ask a member of the club to escort him. No one was allowed to enter unless accompanied by a member of the club. If they weren't on the list, I required confirmation before they could enter. Two men, about my age, just under 30, were waiting at the door. Even if they had been invited, they would not have been allowed in because they were wearing jeans and t-shirts. Jeans were prohibited, only collared shirts and trousers. However, you never know for sure. One of our wealthiest members owned two construction companies, one of which specialized in plumbing. He would arrive covered in mud from head to toe, slip into the locker room, shower, and put on the clothes he kept there before heading to the bar. Good evening, gentlemen. Can I help you with anything? I asked politely. We need to talk to Jerry Stone. Call him to the door. I didn't like his attitude, but he asked about me. Maybe they were looking for work and we were subcontracting landscaping on the golf course. I extended my hand. It's me. I'm Jerry Stone. And you? That's all I had time to say before the taller man caught me off guard with a right hand. Before I could react, the shorter, heavier man threw a punch at me, knocking me to the ground. Have you noticed that the strangest thoughts come to your mind when you are in a difficult situation? I thought about how far I had come from the biker bars where I started, seeing everyone as a threat, to the country club I worked at now, with its politeness and sophistication. They got me, and pretty good when I got lucky. The police chief of our small town and the assistant district attorney, himself a former police officer, were just entering the club. The chief shouted and they threw me away. I stood up, angry as hell, ready to fight, but by that time the chief was already holding them both at gunpoint with the small revolver he always carried with him, which was a requirement of his job. His service weapon was a Glock, but he did not consider it necessary to advertise that he was armed, so he kept a revolver in his pocket a Smith & Wesson. 27. I've shot this revolver, and it packs a heck of a load for its size. What the hell is wrong with you? I almost shouted. Who are you? You know who we are, bastard. We are the husbands of those two wives with whom you made love. Now I was really angry. Listen, Deb. Uh, idiots. I've never seen you or your wives, as far as I know. I don't date married women. This leads to stupid things like this. The assistant prosecutor chuckled. Thank you for sparing our tender ears, Jerry. But these guys really are morons. Do you want to press assault charges? I can find some good witnesses. I looked at them. They both looked like they were about to shit their pants thinking about what might happen. The chief grinned. Yes, aggravated assault. Criminal entry into the territory. This can be applied because they came here specifically to harm you. If you think about it, you can come up with a few more. The shorter one looked very scared. The taller one still looked furious. We wouldn't be here if this guy hadn't slept with our wives. It's his fault. You do everything in such a way that I'm tempted to press charges. What makes you think that I am with your wives? I will give you one chance to tell your story, but not here in front of the club members. I turned to the chief and assistant prosecutor. Could you escort our guests to the office? I'd really like to work things out. I turned to them. I hope you won't refuse to give us a few minutes of your time. I'd like to settle this now before you decide to hide in the dark waiting for me. The tone of my voice let them know that this was not a request. The boss made them show their IDs first, and then we went into my office. Let's talk. Why do you think that I am the one fooling around with your spouses? Because those stupid bitches told us, the tall one growled. Exactly in these terms, Jerry Stone making love to me? The shorter one spoke. Yes, practically. They even told us where you are. Really? Is there any way to get them to come and confirm this? Damn right. These stupid bitches are sitting in the car waiting for us. They described the car and the assistant prosecutor came out and invited them inside, 
They entered timidly. One had a pretty bad bruise on her cheek. The other had bruises on her arms. It looked like someone had grabbed her too tightly. They were neither ugly nor beautiful, just average. If they weren't bruised and scared to death, they might have been a lot cuter. One of them looked around in confusion. Ladies, do I know you? I asked softly, trying to calm them down. I've never seen you before, mister. Where's Jerry? This man said he was here, she said, pointing to the assistant prosecutor. And you? I asked the second one. Don't I seem familiar to you? No. What the hell is going on here? I took out my wallet and showed her my license. Are you Jerry Stone? Are there two of you here? Sorry, ladies, I'm the only one here with that name. Men began to look even more furious. The tall one, obviously the leader in this company, attacked his wife. Bitch, you better not lie to me. Obviously, he was trying to stupidly put himself in prison. I swear I don't know this guy, his wife screamed. The boss has heard enough. Guys, apologize to this man and promise him that he will never see you again and he will not press charges. I have your papers. I think I'll call Sheriff Costner and let him know about your little adventure. He took out his phone and took a few pictures of the bruises. I'm sure he'll stop by tomorrow and check on these ladies. If he finds any more bruises, he won't be happy. His mother was beaten by his father, and he is not very tolerant of such things. Make up or spend the night away from each other. Is it clear? They nodded, looking ashamed. I let them go. It wasn't worth wasting time going to court. Warning that I wouldn't be so lenient if I saw them again, I let them go. We walked them to the door, and I was surprised how women could be seduced by the same guy. Either he had a line of bullshit a mile long, or they were very stupid. I suspected both. Just as we entered the lobby, a man appeared heading towards the bar. He barely noticed us, but one of the women stopped. Jerry? He looked around and turned pale. Both girls started shouting his, uh, my name. He yelped and ran back out the door. Men, women, and the boss rushed after him. The assistant prosecutor looked at me and grinned. The secret is revealed, right? I just sighed, went back to the bar and called the phone. I never wanted to be a bartender. It just happened that way. My parents had six children. Mom stayed at home and raised us, and Dad worked every free hour at the paper mill. There was not a penny left for additional expenses, and none at all for higher education. My uncle had a bar and grill, a real joint but he served honest booze. The kitchen was clean and the food was good and reasonably priced. He gave me my first job, waiting tables and washing dishes. After that, I started cooking as a quick cook, and when I was old enough, I worked in a bar. Along the way, I received lessons on various things, for example, how to recognize troubles. It almost never happens that loud people start doing something, but it was necessary to keep an eye on the quiet ones. Something may upset them, and they retire, go into drink-and-think mode, as my uncle liked to say. Then, a magic drink fell into them, and they exploded. I learned that in my county, if someone is causing trouble, you don't call the cops, you deal with it yourself. If you call them too often, you will be shut down for disturbing them. Besides, when you're working, there's no such thing as a fair fight. You want to minimize exposure to the crowd before they decide to join. So you attack them hard and fast, hurting them. If you do this once or twice, they will learn to behave, or you will ban them. I got a few bumps and bruises, so I learned to fight. Rough at first, but then I got tired of getting hit and took a few lessons. I didn't need a belt. I just wanted to be able to stand up for myself. When I was 20... My uncle shot and killed a guy who stabbed him. He was not imprisoned, but the church ladies rebelled, and he had to close the establishment. For several years, I worked in better places while attending school. I even took bartending classes and tried to keep a straight face long enough to get certified. Now I'm almost done with my final year of college. I'll soon have a degree in hospitality management. I worked at this job for three years working my way up from bartender to assistant bar manager and bar manager. I was also in charge of the restaurant. 
I often worked 10 and 12 hours a day, but I never complained. In a few years, I hoped to become a club manager, and at a place like Briarwood Country Club, that meant a nearly six-figure salary. I was able to work so much because I didn't have much of a home life. I have never been married. The divorce rate among bartenders is astronomical, one of the highest for the profession in the country. I was in a serious relationship with a girl, and she developed a habit of coming over to my place during work so we could spend breaks together. She was young, bored, pretty, and the wolves grabbed onto her, charming her, and soldering alcohol until one evening she disappeared. I walked outside to find her in the backseat of some asshole's car, her underwear hanging off her ankle. I beat the crap out of him, left her, and went to work somewhere better. She tried to apologize, and I truly believed it, but the damage was done. My uncle felt a little sorry for me, but then he laughed. What did you expect? Letting her hang around is like taking your prize chicken to a Martin convention. One universal truth that I have learned in this profession is that there will always be someone who wants a bartender, from socialites to bar-outspoken girls of easy virtue. It didn't take me long to realize it was suicide. If you piss off the right husband or boyfriend, wife or daughter, you'll be out the door. I've learned to find balance by flirting lightly with wives and girlfriends while maintaining distance. And I never crossed the line, either by hint or by direct proposal. It was quite difficult at times. The ladies had their trump cards, and they were indeed there much more often than their men who worked to maintain their lifestyle. The benefit was that they learned that I could be trusted and therefore often asked for my opinion on various issues. This was especially valuable if they wanted to know my opinion about gifts. Since I knew their husbands too, and men often talk about things they don't think their wives would be interested in, I had an advantage. One husband loved fishing, and his wife surprised him with a trip to a luxury mountain resort where he could spend the day trout fishing while she sunbathed by the pool, went shopping, and went to the spa. And in the evenings, they enjoyed each other thanks to my friend Aubrey, who produces underwear. I had a friend who tended bar at a club there, and I told him I would appreciate it if he would take good care of them. He happily agreed, knowing that he would ask for a favor someday. I did the same with men. Pretty soon they realized this and told me directly what they wanted so that I could pass it on to my wife. Some of them were unusual, but most were simple. One day one of my spouses asked me if she could trust me. Almost everything that is not too immoral or illegal. A good bartender can keep secrets better than a priest. This satisfied her, and she told me about her sexual fantasy that she would like to act out with her husband. She seemed fascinated by being tied to the bed, leaving her husband free to do whatever he wanted with her. She wanted to try, but was afraid to tell her husband about it. It took some convincing and a little help from a lingerie friend of mine to purchase the appropriate equipment. She dressed her, tied her to the bed in the hotel room she had rented, and left right before he arrived. I had the key card. I stopped him for one drink. You've had enough to drink, Mr. Reynolds. Your wife wants you to follow these instructions exactly. She wants you to be open and understanding about this birthday gift. Have a nice evening, sir. I hadn't seen them for three weeks, and was worried that I had alienated one of the club members when she arrived, beaming in a silver choker, necklace, with a huge diamond in the middle. She told her friends that he gave it to her for her birthday. Later she found me alone. You know this is my collar, right? Of course, this is all a yoki. But I can never thank you enough. And my husband wanted you to receive this as a token of gratitude. Five hundred dollar bills wrapped in a pair of very small panties. She giggled. I wrapped them myself. Make sure we get the most private table today, okay, dear? I thanked him seriously for the tip later, after he had been sitting at the table for half an hour and his wife was practically dancing in her place. He grinned and held out his hand to his wife, and she licked his fingers as he thanked me for my service. Two months later, I was promoted to assistant bar manager. He was the main sponsor. Every bartender worth his salt has a book. It takes years to make a good book, but once you do... It's worth its weight in gold. If asked, I can name the best mechanic or plumber in town, an under-the-radar doctor or divorce lawyer, and talk them into urgent service. 
A friend of mine who sold lingerie was in on it, as were bartenders in three states. I also had an understanding with the bookmaker and several escort agencies, and here it was necessary to walk a fine line. If a guy had a gambling problem and it led to problems with his wife or financial difficulties, guess who was to blame? It's the same with escort services. If the wife finds out about it, there will be no work. Therefore, I have taken precautions. The bookmaker only allowed a guy to have two bets outstanding at any given time, and the women were very careful. The unwanted publicity did not help any of their businesses. None of these people gave me money, I didn't gamble, and I could sleep with them anytime for free. But if I needed a service, they were there. For the most part, I tried to refer them to other club members if they were working in a suitable field. Many of our members owned their own companies, and it was a quid pro quo arrangement. A friend gave me the idea. His wife hated football, so she made sure she and her friends had something to do to entertain themselves. We always threw big parties, rented the biggest TV we could find, set up a temporary bar in the dance hall. I asked the kitchen to prepare large plates of snacks so they could absorb the alcohol. However, even in this case, in the end, many wives and girlfriends came to take them home. I spoke to a few key women, introduced them to my lingerie friend, and off they went. While the men were watching football, the women were in a small conference room where they were shown the latest new lingerie, the newest toys, they were even helped by a couple of other friends, one a hairdresser, the other a makeup artist. They selected three women at random of different heights, shapes, and ages, gave them full makeovers, and then took them out in public, complete with underwear that suited their shape and age. The kitchen offered more sophisticated snacks, and another friend of mine, the wife of a local winemaker, offered wines. The success was deafening. After the game, the men had to wait for the women. We kept a close eye on this and had three taxis ready. The women insisted that I stop by at the end of the evening to thank me. As they left, the four waited, giggling, until they were the last ones left. We love Aubrey, said one of them. She has the cutest things. Look. She opened her coat, revealing a French-made uniform that suited her very well. Another was wearing a PVC nurse's uniform, the third was wearing an almost see-through teddy, and the last one was wearing a very nice lavender garter belt and nothing else. It was all unexpected, and I ended up blushing, which they thought was adorable. This became an annual event, and we were forced to move it to a larger location. I took college online and actually went to class on Wednesday mornings and Thursday evenings if I could. I made a few friends, but didn't have time to start relationships. After all, it was college, so I picked up someone a few times, but at long intervals. There was one woman who I really liked. We had accounting classes together on Wednesday and business classes on Thursday. Sometimes we met in the library and studied together. She was a little older than me, 31 years old. It was clear from her clothes, jewelry, and car that she had money, but she was nice to everyone even going out with us for pizza and beer sometimes. She paid her share and never showed her wealth. Her smile could melt ice balls. Sweet and caring one second, devilish and flirty the next. And she was very sexy. She knew it, but she never pushed it. She gave college guys a gentle blow if they didn't push her. Otherwise, they got the taste of that bitch. I thought she'd make a damn good bartender. One evening, I was leaving the library as it was, closing, and saw her sitting on a bench with slumped shoulders. I walked over to say hello and she looked up, tears still streaming down her cheeks. Not from physical pain, but from emotions. Do you mind if I sit down? She nodded, groping for tissues in her purse. I always carried a handkerchief with me, which I inherited from my uncle. He might be dressed in jeans and a threadbare t-shirt but his monogrammed handkerchief was always clean and accessible. I handed her mine. Who wears them now? She said, wiping her cheeks. Only gentlemen of the old school, in case they come across an upset girl. This made her smile. She tried to give it away, but I told her to keep it. She sat, turning it in her hands. Do you want to talk about this? Besides providing handkerchiefs, I have fairly soft shoulders and very large ears, no personal intentions, I promise. She even giggled before frowning again. 
it seems to me that you are the only man I have ever seen who I really believe when you say it. And yes, I would like to talk. It could help. But not here. Would you treat the sad girl with a cup of coffee? I immediately knew what she was talking about. A small store near campus. It was clean, cheap, and close, which made it popular with students. The owners of the establishment were well-liked and were known to be intolerant of drunkards. And talkers. It was quiet here. The cabins were located at a great distance from each other. If it was late and you didn't need a table, you could sit and study. We walked up, took coffee, a piece of pie, apple for me, to her cherry. She took a few sips, ate half the pie, leaned back in her chair, and sighed. Of course you know that I'm married, right? I nodded. Only a blind person could miss the stone on her finger. Seven years. I really loved him, you know. I thought that I had an eternal man with whom I would live happily ever after. Looks like no. How long has he been cheating on you? She seemed surprised by my directness. How did you find out? And what makes you think it was him? I shrugged. Easy. In my line of work, you can usually tell the good guys from the bad guys, and you're definitely one of the good ones. You seem to have money, so I don't think that's the issue. You don't have bruises and you don't act like you were mentally abused, so it must be cheating. Why do I think it's not you? Because if that were the case, you wouldn't be sitting on a bench in the dark and crying. You would lead a wild life. So it must be him. Her eyes widened. Are you a psychologist or a detective? It's my turn to laugh. No, a professional bartender. The sad story spilled out. He was a guest lecturer in business classes when she was a full-time college student. She caught his attention and he asked her out. He was almost ten years older, handsome, flattering, attentive. She fell head over heels in love with him and they were married nine months later. He paid attention to her, showered her with small gifts, and she was very happy. After about four years, he began to change, neglect her, and move away. She expressed this to him, he apologized, promised to improve, and did this for about six months. She wanted to start a family, but he persuaded her to wait, saying that the time had not yet come. The last year had been bad. Every weekend he was away on a business trip for a new business they had started, leaving on Thursday and not returning until late Saturday. He seemed happier after he started traveling, but was still cold towards her. She ended up taking some of his money and investigating. Of course, he had affairs. She received confirmation of her fears. He doesn't have a regular girlfriend. It seems like these are casual relationships, four that I know of, and who knows how many in total. He traveled for about six months before I decided to check him out. I was scared to death. I found a doctor several cities away from us and underwent a full examination. Thank God the result was clean, but it was scary. Since I found out, we haven't had a relationship. I can't call it lovemaking. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem to bother him that much. Curiosity took over. What are your plans? Are you going to confront him? Are you trying to improve your relationship? She shook her head decisively. No. He's finished. He just doesn't know it yet. However, this will happen very soon. This is one of the reasons I return to college. He thinks I take a full load, and telling him that the classes I need are mostly in the evenings has made it easier for me to stay away from him. I need a few more hours to complete my accounting degree, and I intend to use it to make sure he doesn't try to cheat me in the calculation. He always joked that the only thing he could love more than me was money. I've already found several duplex apartments and a couple of business buildings that we own, which he never told me about. I have a good team that digs. I'll know everything when the showdown comes. She sighed. Don't think I'm a gold digger. I brought money into the marriage, which helped him a lot, and this is one of the main reasons why there was no prenuptial agreement. So if he loves available women and money more than me, I'm going to hit him where it hurts. I kind of understood her logic. Why delay this? You're clearly not going to keep him. Why beat a dead horse? You are beautiful, admittedly well-endowed, and still young enough to find someone to start the family you want. I bet you'll be a great mom, with a Mercedes instead of a minivan. Go away. Find happiness. She smiled for the first time that evening. So I'm beautiful? 
great mother material? Maybe I'll use your plan to find someone better. It seems you are not married. I blushed, and she laughed loudly. You're out of my league. I would be a male Cinderella. One could only dream about this. A rich, beautiful wife who must be absolutely stunning in other areas. And you know what I mean. You are an unattainable dream, baby. She was still giggling, but then she hit me on the arm and became serious. Don't sell yourself. I saw how the girls looked at you. And Vivian, one of my few friends, gave you a pretty good review. But my next meeting will be for love. And lust, of course. For me, it was getting too deep. I looked at my watch. It's time to go home. I have a long day tomorrow. I'm glad you decided to trust me, and I will never tell. Actually, it's none of my business. If I were to give you advice, I would say that it's time to make yourself happy. I moved my chair away from her. Rescue ladies in trouble, hold doors, chairs, carry handkerchiefs. Are you a time traveler? There are no people like you in our century. Consider me old-fashioned. I respect everyone until I know they are not respectable and good manners are ageless. Good night, Marie. I walked her to the car and she surprised me by kissing me on the lips. I was stunned. She pulled away, smiling. I just wanted to make sure you were real. Good night, Jerry. I watched the taillights of her Cadillac ATS fade into the distance, got into my pickup truck, and headed home to my empty bed. After that evening, Marie and I drank coffee almost every Thursday, often with friends. In company, she was ebullient and enthusiastic, but when we were alone, she was often thoughtful and sad. I happened to find out that it was her birthday next Thursday, and we planned a little surprise party. She thought we were going to have coffee, but when she got there, she was ambushed. Seven of us took her to a little jazz bar one of our friends had discovered, and we had a blast. Not hard, not out of control, but we had a good time. I think she danced with every man in the bar. It was all over too soon. I will always remember how her body merged with mine during one of the slow dances. I walked her to the car. She held my hand, and when I opened the door, she quickly kissed me on the cheek. Hold it. I almost forgot. Happy birthday, Marie. It was a dozen old ladies' handkerchiefs, soft little squares with embroidery around the edges. I monogrammed them with her initials. In case I'm not there when you need it, she burst into tears and threw herself into my arms. I hugged her and gently stroked her back until she calmed down. Sorry, she said between bouts of hiccups. This is one of the nicest gifts I've ever received. She grimaced, making a weak attempt at a smile. Do you know what my husband gave me? Necklace made of sapphires and diamonds? Expensive, I'm sure, but the card was signed by his assistant. I kissed him deeply, told him that I had always loved sapphires. How did he know? He smiled broadly, said that he was much more attentive than I thought, and then said that he would be out of town that weekend. Leave him alone, Marie. Do it now. Don't torture yourself anymore. I'm almost there. Three more weeks, a month, and it will all be over. Can I call you if I need moral support? Certainly. I knew she would never call. I was wrong. She called the following Tuesday. Can I ask you a favor? Certainly. I want to go to the Home and Garden Exhibition next Wednesday afternoon. It's your day off, right? I wondered where this would lead. You know it's true. There was impatience in her voice. Will you come with me? You drive a pickup truck, right? If I decide to buy something, you can bring it to me. Please? I thought for a minute. I don't know, Marie. This looks suspiciously like a date. You know my rules. I told her some of my biography, told her a lot of what I had seen over the years of working in the bar. She knew my stance on dating married women. This is not a date. This is one friend helping another. Please. I shouldn't have done this, but I agreed to accompany her. She met me in the parking lot. We had a great time, especially in the landscaped area. I discovered that she loves open spaces and loves to cook outside. We looked at several pre-planned outdoor kitchens. She ooed and awed. I really liked one of them. The company representative, anticipating the sale, put full pressure on him. He was smart enough to realize that women were the driving force behind most household purchases. 
so he approached Marie. Can't you imagine having fun while your husband runs the grill while you socialize and chat? He seems pretty handy. You'll get a big discount if he does most of the work. She smiled, patting my hand. He is very skilled, but not with tools, if you understand me correctly. I'd rather save his energy for other activities. Both the representative and I blushed. She took all the information and brochures, promising that we would think about it. We stayed there for so long that when we left, it was already dark. She was happy all the way to the parking lot. Do you want to have dinner? I surprised her by refusing. I would love to, but I'm not going to. Think about your reputation, Marie. At school, you can explain this by saying that we are study partners and friends. You can explain today by the fact that you asked me to move things in my pickup truck. But dinner? Not a good idea, she moaned. The first man I've become attached to in a long time, and he has to ruin everything by thinking about me and being chivalrous. I think I would like you more if you weren't so noble. No, I wouldn't like it. If I wasn't like that, I'd be just another creep, trying to seduce and take advantage of a married woman with problems. We'd both think badly of me, both of us. I will never be able to do this. I looked around. It was dark. No one was around. So I grabbed her and kissed her deeply. She answered with passion. After thirty seconds I realized what we were doing and pulled away. We were both out of breath. What was it? She asked once her breathing became controlled. It is, dear Marie, that I made you understand that, no matter what I say, I have liked you from the very day we met. And I also wanted to confirm what I had long suspected. You are a very hot woman. Good night. As I sat in my pickup waiting to follow her, I was sure she was crying. I thought I saw flashes of white from my gift. I watched her tail lights disappear and I pulled off the road and drove home and didn't sleep well. Obviously, my behavior in the parking lot impressed Marie. I was casually flirting with a woman in one of the classes that Marie and I didn't share, and she asked me out on a date. Some time passed, and I agreed. We had a pleasant evening and a pleasant morning. It was just for fun, at least on my part. I think she liked it and made it clear that she would like to do it again. We made tentative plans for next weekend. Marie learned about this from a guy from both classes. I didn't see it in person, but she tracked the woman down and had a little talk. The next day, when I was talking to Guile, the girl I was dating, she told me off. You're an asshole. Why did you date me if you were in a serious relationship? Your girlfriend scolded me quite harshly. Does this girlfriend have a name? You know very well that it was Marie. If I were you, I wouldn't get my hopes up about getting anything from her anytime soon. And you sure as hell aren't getting it from me. From now on... You and your psycho girlfriend need to leave me alone. I apologized to her as I left. She gave me a farewell glance. If I were you, I wouldn't try to do that again. She gave her word. If you date, things could get really bad. Now I knew why Marie had rushed to leave the night before. The following Thursday, I ambushed her before class. Pizzeria right after class. You're like Lucille Ball, an actress. You definitely need to do something. I got there early and ordered, knowing what she liked. She slid into the booth, head down. Do you want to tell me about your conversation with Gail? Finally, she looked up. She's not right for you, and she's too young. You need to stay away from women like her. Mari, even if what you say is true, shouldn't it be my decision? What will you gain from your actions? Her eyes flashed. If I have to tell you this, then you are the stupidest man in the world. You need a woman close in age with experience in the real world who can compliment you in public and destroy you in private. You mean someone like you? She rolled her eyes as if she were talking to an idiot. No, not someone like me. Me. I suspected this, but now that it was out in the open, I didn't know how to deal with it. Marie, I... Stop talking. This will only drive me crazy. Listen to me. I am attracted to you. After that kiss last night and your statement, I know you want me. Don't overthink it. I promise you that as soon as I get out of this situation I find myself in, I will come for you. That's why I got rid of Gail. I don't need you to be distracted. You need to be focused on me. Understood? Yes, but... 
No buts, she said firmly and walked out the door. I put the pizza in the box, drove home, and thought it over. Almost done, she told me three weeks later. I have a team of forensic accountants, supposedly the best there are, who review our financial records. It's easy once I have access and most of the passwords. Some things were blocked, but they managed to get inside. I was surprised, but not as much as he would be surprised. I just need to decide how bad I want to ride him. Do you want to know my opinion? She nodded, seemingly eager to hear what she had to say. Do it quietly. Keep it as unnoticeable as possible. I don't know what you do, so think about how it might affect your business. Remember, if you try to burn it, the heat may return and it will end up costing you dearly. She ruffled my hair. I'll say it again. You are very noble. Most people would advise me to use nuclear weapons. However, if he refuses to cooperate or tries to cause harm, I may have to increase the pressure. But I will again yield to your logic. With that being said, almost as a single woman whose soon-to-be ex is out of town, may I interest you in going out for a drink? Mary, she stuck out her tongue. Where are you going to hide when I'm officially free? I will pursue you tirelessly. Is it clear? I was a little taken aback. There was a spark between us that couldn't be denied, but I was out of her league and I told her so. We'll see, she said, and if you're worried about money, I'll let you pay every time we go out. I'm not that hard on myself, honey. She saw that I was becoming uneasy and softened. I walked her to the car, parked behind her for some reason. She looked around, didn't see anyone, and practically pounced on me and kissed me. She rubbed herself against me, and when we finally parted, she grinned and stroked me through my pants. You may have morals, but you are human, and some part of you likes the idea of us being together. I got the shock of my life, when a week later she walked into the bar on the arm of her husband. Suddenly many things made sense. I remember how strange she looked at me when I told her where I worked. Almost everyone at the country club didn't care about him. He was a narcissistic, smarmy asshole who was quick to find any opportunity. He was handsome, fit, with graying hair that gave him the appearance of a respectable executive. But he acted as if he was still in college, although he was already quite old. He was tolerated and had a small cabal that loved him, including two powerful board members. He was always flirtatious but respectful with the ladies. I guess he didn't want to make waves since he had been a member for less than a year, keeping up appearances and all that. I had never seen Marie in anything other than jeans and simple summer dresses, which I must say she looked damn good in. Black hair styled in an intricate swirl, discreet makeup, highlighting her light brown eyes, lipstick and eyeliner, drawing the eye to her perfectly shaped lips that seemed to demand kisses. A standard little black dress with a slight cleavage and long legs, complemented by four-inch heels. This was the first time I saw her there. I didn't think he was married. I've never seen him with a wedding ring. Tonight I noticed he had it on him. He introduced her. He looked prude, but proud in a look-what-I've-got kind of way, not this is the love of my life. By the time he got to the bar, I had already prepared him a drink. She sat down on a chair in the corner next to my workplace. What would you like, ma'am? I took pride in my professional behavior. She smiled at me because his back was turned. Oh, I don't really like drinking. Why don't you give me what you would drink if you weren't on duty? I will bring it now. I handed her a double portion of pure rye, adding water. She took a sip and nodded. Soft, not too strong. I was afraid that you would come up with some kind of fruit cocktail with an outlandish name. That's much better. She turned to her husband. He's very good, Winslow. Don't you agree? He was busy talking with one of his friends. He waved his hand dismissively. Yes, Jerry is more than adequate. Listen, honey, I need to get some air, things to do, you know? Jerry will take care of you, won't he, Jerry? As if she were my own, sir, I said with an impassive expression. Marie choked slightly on her drink. Good, good. I'll be right back, honey. I looked at her as he left. Don't look at me like that, she said as soon as no one was around. I didn't know where we were going until we got here. This is the first time I'm here with him, she giggled. 
Besides, maybe it's good to watch you in your natural habitat. Get some ideas that will help me in seducing you. Luckily, I had to leave then. When I returned, Mrs. Everly was next to her, and they were talking like long-lost sisters. Oh, here you are. Can I have another drink, please? Evelyn, would you like some more? Jerry, honey, could you ask Aubrey to call me? Tom's birthday is in two weeks, and I want to make it special. Consider it done. I'll ask her to call tomorrow afternoon. I smiled. Mrs. Everly was about 60, but she had done a little work on herself and looked damn good for her age. She was the one wearing a nurse's uniform at the lingerie party. The next week, Tom shook my hand and thanked me. She's sexier than she was years ago, and she said she owes it to you and some woman named Aubrey. She turned to Marie. Marie, you should come more often. I'll introduce you to the ladies who run this place. Just don't tell your husbands this. Don't ruin their illusions. And if you need anything, anything, tell Jerry. I am not kidding. He can get or do almost anything for you. Well, almost everything. He hasn't delivered the dancer from Chippendale yet. Mrs. Everly, I'm still looking for the perfect one. You deserve the best. She giggled and patted my hand. Marie grinned. Perhaps I will do so, Evelyn. Come more often, I mean, and maybe I'll take Jerry up on the offer. I can think of a few things I would like him to do for me. I had to leave. Winnie the Pooh, as I mentally nicknamed her husband, finally appeared, had another drink, and they left. She did not fail to shake my hand, thanking me for my services, present and future. I was sure she swayed her hips slightly as she walked out the door, knowing I was watching her. Mrs. Everly was watching too. She seems nice. Don't you think so, Jerry? I agree, Mrs. Everly. I'm sure she's very nice. But I don't really like her husband. I didn't say anything, but I agreed wholeheartedly. Two weeks, and then, boom. Three weeks, Jerry, and the chase has begun. She was in a very good mood. I liked watching her smile. It was like the air after heavy rain. Everything around me became sharper, cleaner, in focus, more beautiful because of it. And then I made a moral lapse and we made love. It was stupid, but aren't most accidents stupid? I went outside to talk to a local farmer. Since the slow food movement was firmly established, I was constantly collaborating with the chef to bring something new to the menu. This farmer specialized in traditional and rare products and was having trouble finding a market for some of them until he met us. On this day, he was bringing African horned melons, also known as jelly melons or, less flatteringly, as snot melons. They were cylindrical small fruits, variegated orange-yellow, with thorns covering them, quite sharp spines. The flesh was light green and somewhat slimy, hence the nickname. I tried them and found them almost tasteless. They've just been named the new superfood, and Aaron, our chef, made a salad with them as the centerpiece. The ladies liked him. I went outside to look at the bananas he managed to grow. Tiny pink things that taste amazing. He grew a dozen trees just for fun and gave the harvest to friends and clients. I helped him with the delivery, mainly because I liked talking to him and wanted to soak up the sun. We stood next to the cart. He was drunk, reached for another glass of beer and ran into me. I guess I should be glad it was a golf cart and not a car. A trip to the ER left me with a knee brace, four stitches in my arm, and a terrible headache. I was also left without work for two weeks, without any conversation. The next day I was limping into the office for two hours, looking at my temp book, checking the schedule with the head chef and assistant bar manager, getting ready for my vacation when the club manager and the chairman of the board walked into my office. Directors. Jerry, how are you feeling? There seemed to be genuine concern in his voice. He was a good man who rose from nothing and built a successful business. He had been chairman for quite some time, and the club was his third passion, after his late wife and business. Despite his age, he seemed to be attracted to women who were old enough to be his daughters. It's all about the money, Jerry, he said late one night when we were practically alone in the bar and he was in a great mood. All you have to do is put a zero after the number and it will make you ridiculously beautiful. I like it, but it won't get me anywhere. My late wife set the bar too high and I haven't found anyone who can come close to it. 
It hurts, I said, coming back to the present and grinning. The doctor said I could return in two weeks, but only on a limited basis. We just want you to know that the club will cover all your expenses and salary. If you need anything else, let us know. He paused, hesitating. What do you want to do with Bob? Bob was the guy who ran me over. I knew they were worried about possible legal consequences. I bear him no ill will. I know it was an excitant and he was a decent guy when he was sober. Suspension for a month. What if it was a guest, or one of the staff, or even a member of the club? The club would be in complete crap. And when he returns, he won't drive a cart for at least three months. This is my proposal. Both breathed a sigh of relief. Ready? Thank you, Jerry. And Bob wants to apologize to you. He really regrets what happened. Tell him we'll talk when his suspension is over. We talk some more, and I returned to my apartment where the prescribed pain pill was waiting for me. I was almost instantly plunged into a pleasant fog. There was persistent knocking on the door. I listened to him for what seemed like an eternity before I finally got up from the couch. Marie almost knocked me over as she ran inside. How badly are you injured? They should shoot this idiot. I shook my head, trying to clear it. I tried to speak, but it came out slurred. Poor baby. Let me help you get into bed. She led me into the bedroom and sat me down on the bed. She took off my shirt and helped me strip down to my boxers, slowly taking off my loose sweatpants so as not to hurt me. She laid me down, ruffled my hair, and kissed me softly. I passed out. Later, I half woke up feeling warm, soft flesh pressing against me. It felt so good that I hugged her tighter and fell asleep again. Opening my eyes, I saw Marie carefully straddling me, her eyes closed in bliss. I was sure it was a dream. She was surrounded by a golden glow and was smiling. Maybe it was the medication, but I felt tears running down my cheeks. I was so happy. I imagined her kissing my tear-stained cheek as I passed out. I opened my eyes, trying to understand why I felt so good. Looking around, I saw a pair of beautiful brown eyes and an even more beautiful smile. Good morning, darling. Are you feeling better? Before I could answer, she jumped out of bed. I heard the shower running and then she came out wearing my robe. Do you need help? I'd be glad to help you. I'll make sure everything is clean. She did help me into the shower, but there was no game. After that, she helped me put on my shorts and jock strap. She whirled around the kitchen, making coffee. She put our cups down and sat down, smiling. How did you know that I was hurt? Evelyn told me. She called and invited me to an impromptu lingerie party. I said it would be my pleasure. She seems very nice. I mentioned you, and she said again that she thought well of you. And wasn't it a shame that you got hurt? I turned off the phone as quickly as I could. I needed to see you. Make sure you were okay. How did you find out where I live? She blushed slightly. I was helped by a private detective I hired for Winslow. It took him 30 minutes. I didn't know what else to do. I had no one to ask. She looked nervously around the kitchen. Say it, I said, urging her on. I'm so sorry you got hurt. I knew you were alone and I just had to come. I felt that you needed me. And yes, I used your weakened physical and mental state to take advantage of you. If you're waiting for an apology, don't waste your time, because there won't be one. I would do it again. Moreover, I want to do this again. Often and for as long as you allow me. So there you go. I kept my expressionless gaze until she looked unhappy. I then smiled, kissed her on the cheek, and told her that I might accept her offer after she was legally free. She practically danced around the kitchen, chatting incessantly. I just sipped my coffee, smiling. She left late in the evening. She wanted to play, but the pain kept coming back, and I still felt out of sorts, so nothing more happened. She packed her bag for the night and decided to take another shower, leaving the door open. She came out with a towel wrapped around her head and nothing else. I admired her body, her high, firm breasts. Winnie the Pooh is an idiot. How can someone even cheat on you? Not just your body or mind, but the whole package? I'll never understand. She sat next to me, still naked, giggling at the nickname. 
I thought about this a lot. I even talked to a psychologist. She said that for him, most likely, it was power to have a beautiful and rich wife and at the same time go to bed with almost everyone who said yes. She said that it usually has something to do with his origin. I'll never know and frankly I don't care anymore. The fact that he never pressured me after I rejected him suggests that he never considered sex vital to our relationship. She looked at her watch. I have to go. I have a meeting with accountants and a lawyer, putting the finishing touches on the documents. I'll call you later. You better answer. She kissed me deeply and swam away. I sat and thought, tormented by doubts. I had to admit that I had feelings for her, but was I just a rebound, filling a need until she regained her balance? Can I take the risk? In addition, she actively pursued me when she was still married. Could this be a pattern? Did I want to find out? I passed out after taking a painkiller. Four hours later, I woke up. I had four missed calls from her. The last message told me to call her as soon as I received the message and that he was not at home. I shouldn't have done this, but I called. She was animated and talked about how well the meetings had gone. We talked on the phone for an hour before I told her I needed to call it a day. The meds were starting to work again. Bye, honey, I love... I'll talk to you tomorrow. Ten days later, I returned to work, mostly doing paperwork, avoiding touching my knee as much as possible. I returned, and two days later, I was attacked by those two morons for seducing their wives with Winnie the Pooh. I hobbled back to the office, knowing that my knee would give me hell tomorrow, and wondering if I would be able to get an appointment with my doctor. I called Marie, told her the whole story, and told her that if she needed it, both the chief and the assistant prosecutor could testify. It tears everything apart. In a way, this is even good. I have something to strengthen my position with. I'll try to get the bailiff and the police officer on duty to be here when he gets home. I'm not going to stay and argue with him. Anything he says won't matter in the slightest. I'll rent a suite for a few weeks while they sort out the paperwork. Can I count on your support? Always, but so far, only from afar. It will be better this way. She didn't like it, didn't like it at all, but she had to respect it. Three weeks later, she walked into a bar. She quickly became friends with most of the ladies, and they sang my praises about her. One day, Evelyn started talking about her after a tennis match. She seems like such a nice girl. You should take a closer look at her when this is all over. She is very beautiful, wealthy, and she seems to like you. Mrs. Everly, what are these inappropriate words? I don't know if you know, but I'm a part-time college student. In three months, I will receive my diploma. Miss Marie was in several of my classes and we became friends. Of course, this was before I knew about her unhappy marriage or that they were members of a club. She is everything you say and more, a lot more. But she is beyond my reach and I would never embarrass her by trying to prove otherwise. She looked at me for a few seconds before bursting out laughing. Jerry, honey, I always thought you were pretty smart for a man, but this statement just disproved that. If she likes you and is attracted to you, you need to do something about it. People fall in love all the time, regardless of their social and economic level. That's life. You love who you love. Do you think I was born for money? I was the fourth daughter of a Pennsylvania miner, and we were very poor. I went to college on a scholarship, met Tom, and never looked back. Oh, I had bad feelings and my mother-in-law never loved me, but we've been together for 33 years. Money is good, but I would marry him if he was a minor like my father. I think I know you better than you think, Jerry. My father and husband are cut from the same cloth. Her marriage ended before you even met her, so it's not your fault that you have feelings for her. I admire your sense of honor, but it has no place here. It's time for me to go, darling. Think about what I said. That's exactly what I did. It got even worse. Mrs. Everly told her friends, and they started a campaign, constantly bringing us together, guessing the time when I would be free. Marie thought it was funny. Come on, honey. Everyone in the universe thinks you and I together is a good idea, except you. I know. I see it in your eyes. Deep down, you think so too. Temper your sense of decency and let it happen and there is no need to refer to the fact that my marriage is interfering. I not only filed for divorce, 
but also legally separated from him until it ends. I didn't have to do this. I did it in hopes of appeasing your pride. I've thought about this a lot. Maybe everyone was right. Maybe I was a fool. Then something happened that made me think I was too late. These were dinner dances that took place once a month at the club. Marie twice asked me to accompany her, but I was afraid that this might affect my professional activities. Even if I came as her guest, I would still be an employee, and some would frown upon that. I explained my reasons to her, but she was still upset. I was in my usual place, watching, not letting the waitresses and staff relax. When she entered, with a companion, she came straight to me. Good evening, Jerry. This is my companion for the evening, Don Thompson. You may recognize this name. His family owns Thompson Manufacturing. I told him that you are the best in the business and that you will take good care of us. So she replaced me for a more handsome man out of money. Looking for something like this, I guess. Her eyes studied my face. Years of training paid off as I kept a calm expression without batting an eyelid. Thank you for your trust, Mrs. Martin. The club will do everything possible to ensure that you and your guests have fun. I'm afraid I'm not physically fit yet. I pointed to the cane that I still had to use when my knee hurt. But I'll ask Suzanne to take care of you personally. Please forgive me. I hobbled over to Suzanne, the new bartender I'd hired, to ask her to keep an eye on them. She looked at me strangely. She had been here long enough to hear the rumors, but complied with the order. I stayed a few more minutes watching them slowly waltz around, and then went into my office and closed the door. I stayed there for 45 minutes, then walked around the office to make sure everything was going smoothly before leaving, citing pain. The next day I had the day off, but as soon as I entered, an ambush awaited me. Mrs. Everly, Mrs. Jones, Mrs. Simpson are the big three in terms of the number of wives of company members. Two husbands had seats on the board of directors. Another headed our charitable foundation, raising funds to send disadvantaged young people to community college and beyond. To the office quickly, Mrs. Everly snapped. Wondering what was going on, I invited them in, made them sit down and sat at my table. How can I help you this morning, beautiful ladies? I asked kindly. You can stop being stupid, Mrs. Simpson snapped. What? Mrs. Everly placed a reassuring hand on her arm. What she means, dear, is that you seriously offended one of the club members. We are here to prevent the situation from getting worse. She paused while I thought. I can't remember ever having offended any of the club members during my time here, except for the few times I had to stop serving alcohol to someone. Who is he, and what did I do to offend him? I will do everything in my power to make things right. That's the attitude, Jerry. I knew we could rally on you and the offended club member is a woman, Marie Martin. I suddenly had a very bad feeling about this whole thing. How did I often Mrs. Martin? Looking back, I cannot remember a single instance of disrespect or neglect towards her. Mrs. Jones intervened. Stop it, Jerry. Everyone with eyes and ears knows she's in love with you, and you'll feel the same if you just admit it. Last weekend, she started crying halfway through the dance. Her boyfriend got tired of this and left her. Her friends, including us, took her home. She just went on a date with him to make you jealous and push you. Now we expect you two to kiss and make up. In the near future, if she continues to be unhappy, it will make us unhappy and we will make our husbands unhappy. It's a trickle effect when you're standing at the bottom of a hill. Do you get the point? They all looked at me expectantly. I sat back and thought for a moment before speaking. Let me clear things up. Despite all the work I've done and years of service in this place, my future here is limited to dating a member of the club. Carrot or stick, right? Marie is the carrot, and my future is the stick. Did I assess the situation correctly? Everyone had the decency to look awkward and a little embarrassed. We're just trying to help two people we like be together, honey. Please don't try to understand anything else. You're a great fit. We'll get a happy member and keep someone we value as much more than just an employee. I seriously thank the ladies, promising to quickly solve the problem. They left, chatting happily. Suzanne said it was like a bomb went off in the building when they realized I was gone, and the chairman received my resignation letter. I disappeared for a week, using my connections to stay off the grid, 
avoiding two resorts and a high-end bar in three states, until I calm down. The ladies should have talked to my parents. He is the least pressure-resistant person I have ever seen. He will not tolerate it, even if it is for his own good. My mother often said this. My father said that I should get a job and teach mules to be stubborn. I would earn very good money. On the way back, I stopped by to see them. It was Sunday, and my distant relatives, at least those who could come, often dined with my parents, bringing dishes and putting finishing touches on the house. Everything was quiet when I walked through the door. What? I said before everyone started chatting again. We're just surprised to see you, that's all. I'm surprised that you still remember where we live. I hugged her, twirled her around, and then put her on the ground. You can shame me, Mom, but you know my schedule. It's hard for me to get home, especially on weekends. The good news is that I may have something more stable in the future. We ate, and I entertained them with stories from the bar and stupid things rich people do until noon. Mom caught me on the porch and sat me next to her on the swing. What's going on, son? I have no idea what you're talking about, Mom. She reached out and took my shoulder. Two days ago, your girlfriend came looking for you. Marie seems like a very nice person. She was very upset. Why did you quarrel? She knew me well. If she hadn't held my hand, I would have gotten up and run away. She's not my friend, Mom, and we didn't fight, even if she was. She smoothed out her dress, letting me calm down. Well, something definitely set her off. She looked everywhere for you and said she needed to apologize to you. It's none of my business, of course, but I think she loves you. And I still need one more to make my dozen. She knew it would make me laugh. She always said that she wanted to have a dozen grandchildren, and the last one arrived two years ago, number 11. I'll call her when I get home, I promise. You'll see. I'm getting close to the end, and I'd like you to settle down with a good woman before I go. I kissed her on the cheek. You're 61, Mom, and you're healthier than me. You will outlive us all. I said goodbye and was home by midnight. I stayed at home for about an hour, just got into bed when someone started knocking on my door. Marie. When I opened it, she rushed into my arms, almost knocking me off my feet. Crying and talking, I simply let her go until she calmed down. Where have you been? Do you have any idea how many people were looking for you? No matter. I need to tell you something before you kick me out. I was waiting. I only went with this guy to make you jealous. He is nothing to me. I cried when you performed the performance and then left. I was so disgusted with him that he left me alone at the dance. Apparently, money doesn't teach you good manners. And I had no idea what Evelyn and her friends were going to do. When you retired, it hit the fan and suffice to say there are now a few wives in the club on a short leash. You're still working. They refuse to accept your resignation. The chairman told me he expects a call as soon as you return, and he gave me hell for a while. I wondered what the significance of what she did was to the chairman, but I ignored it. Marie, I, I had to stop. She didn't want to shut up. Finally, I growled at her. Marie, shut up! She immediately stopped. But before I could speak, she began again, bursting into tears. Now you're telling me that we'll never be together. I understand. I just... In desperation, I decided that the only way to keep her quiet was to occupy her mouth with something else. So I started kissing her. Firmly. It took her a second to realize it. Then she returned them. Even stronger. I was sure there would be bruises on our lips. When we broke away from each other, she looked at me with sparkling eyes. Is this what it takes to shut you up? If this is so, then I will never shut up. I'll talk and talk and talk and... I kissed her again for a few minutes. When we paused, I saw the beginnings of a smile. She opened her mouth, but I pressed my fingers to her lips. Enough, or next time I'll spank you. It's my turn to speak, okay? She giggled. It's not that much of a threat, but okay. I'm all ears. I was just about to say that evening that I wanted us to go out somewhere, to be seen, to see if we could somehow make it happen. Then you showed up with your boyfriend, and then the ladies at the club tried to blackmail me, and I just lost it, and... That was all I had time to say when she kissed me. Clothes were removed slowly, carefully, and then hastily torn. She screamed almost all night, 
I barely made a sound because it was so strong it took my breath away. My knee hurt like hell, but I didn't care. I woke up to her rustling in the kitchen. She was naked except for her apron. I grabbed her from behind. She leaned her head back to kiss me, and we were just getting started when the doorbell rang. I grabbed the robe and she ran into the bedroom. It was the chairman. Well, this will be interesting. He didn't wait for an invitation and walked straight past me. Will they offer me coffee? I finally got over my surprise. Of course, sir. Cream? Sugar? Black will do. Where the hell have you been? Your assistant is an idiot who can't handle pressure. Your Suzanne is a real treasure. If it weren't for her and the chef, the place would collapse. Didn't you receive my email? Oh, that joke? We had a good laugh before wiping it off. Do you think your knee will recover in a couple of days? I think Suzanne can hold out for about that long before she snaps and kills him. Just when I thought this couldn't get any more surreal, Marie came out of the bedroom wearing a t-shirt and nothing else. She walked over and kissed the chairman on the cheek and then took the cup. Hello, Daddy. Have you already talked some sense into your future son-in-law? I know I looked like a deer caught in headlights. Marie, laughing, knocked on the table and the chairman grinned. It's a pity that I didn't remember to take my phone with me. You should have seen your face. The chairman finally laughed. Call me John. In the end, if everything works out, we will see each other much more often. And Mari, remember your lesson. I know he's a little slow, but he'll come to you with a question soon, I'm sure. Now I have to go to work, and you need to clean up the mess you made when you left. And if anyone asks, you were leaving to get your knee treated. See you at the club tonight. He patted me on the back, leaning in so she couldn't hear. Ask her quickly. She made a fool of herself because of you. Help her regain her dignity. I'll take care of it. I promise. I said quietly, so she wouldn't hear. She looked at us suspiciously, wondering what we were talking about. We showered together, played a little, tried showering together again, gave up and made love, then showered separately again. I don't think I've ever been so clean in my life. Suzanne and Aaron did everything except roll out the red carpet for me when I walked in. They were so happy to have me back. Michael, the assistant manager, almost kissed me. I learned something about myself. I'm not a leader. When you feel better, can I go back to being a regular bartender, please? I assured him that we would have a place for him and got down to business. I worked steadily until almost seven, when Marie came in. She kissed me deeply in front of everyone. No one looked surprised. Many were grinning. Lunch break, darling. You need to save your energy for rehab and stuff like that. I followed her into the dining room without protest. She made a reservation. I looked at her. Aaron knows what you like. I'm just maximizing our time. We chatted a bit about trivial matters while enjoying our meal. Over coffee, we moved on to serious matters. Okay, spit it out. Why didn't you tell me who your father is? You were already worried about money and position. I can imagine your reaction if I said, By the way, my dad is the chairman of the board where you work. Now let's talk about more pleasant things, like what you might want to ask me. I smiled at her hopeful face. In due time, my beauty. First we need to end this annoying little scam. She frowned. Can you believe this asshole wants counseling? What does he hope to achieve? It doesn't matter. I'll answer it myself. It's better to break up. He almost had a heart attack when we showed him how much he was hiding from me, including the offshore account and the exact amount on deposit. My lawyer says we need to let him play out. If he sees that we are in no hurry, he may give in and reach an agreement earlier. It would be better not to let information leak that we are in a serious relationship. It's quite difficult to keep it a secret now. I turned around to see what she was looking at. The big three rushed towards us at full speed. I stood up, kindly inviting them to sit down. To my surprise, they refused. We just came to apologize. What we did was wrong, and our husbands strongly reinforced this to us. We shouldn't have interfered. Will you forgive a few old ladies who tried to help love go faster? I looked at them decisively. No. They looked at me in shock. I tried to enjoy the moment, but I couldn't resist smiling. 
I can't forgive those who gave me a kick in the ass that sent me in the right direction. I am indebted to you. And thank you. Thank you very much. They smiled, decided they wanted to chat, and sat down. After a few more minutes, I looked at my watch and stood up. Ladies, as much as I enjoy the company I'm in, I have to get back to work. I hope the rest of your evening is enjoyable. They insisted that I kiss each of them on the cheek, except Marie, who pulled me towards her and kissed me deeply. The older ladies giggled when she said she would see me at home. Thank God, everything was resolved. Now, ladies, I'll leave you to spend a little time planning my future without my input, because so far everything is going well. Do you agree, Marie? The whole table lit up with a bright light, and I left. I wanted to whistle. Marie decided that I was far enough away not to hear them. So, Aunt Evelyn, what's on your mind? Wedding plans, dear. What else? I was already halfway across the room when I heard it. I turned around to see Marie with her hand over her mouth while the others laughed. I smiled at her and she relaxed. As I went back to work, I wondered if I even had any chance when she decided she wanted me. Most likely not. The divorce finally took place five months later. He struggled with this and forced him to go to counseling. When he had exhausted all options and even the lawyer told him that he was wasting his time, he began to bargain. It turned out that they owned three car dealerships. He had one when they got married and they used her money to invest in two more. This led to his travels. He ended up getting his original dealership, all the apartments, office buildings, their old house, and his not-so-hidden bank account. She got a Ford Hyundai dealership and a Buick Honda Subaru dealership, as well as some investments and some cash. By a little, I mean a lot. On the day when everything was finally decided, I went to court with her. Surprisingly, he was also present. He constantly looked back at us and Marie continued to show me small public signs of attention. When we left the courtroom, he was ready to explode. Running up to us in the corridor, he practically screamed, You bitch! Bartender! You're kidding, right? Fucking barman! You must have ratted me out! I'll kill your gold-digging ass! I pushed the shocked Marie away from me, peering at what was happening. The bailiff and deputy sheriff in the courtroom were too far away to reach him. His lawyer was there, but he could not come between us. I let him approach, dodged his lunge, throwing him off balance and smiled as he slammed his head into the wall. He jumped up and saw me standing ready in front of him. I hit him in the stomach, hard. As he lay gasping for breath, the cops arrived with stun guns at the ready. He just didn't understand the concept of leave while you're losing and swore at me again and knocked over an aging bailiff trying to get to me. By then, a state trooper was there and he was tased so hard that he lit up like a Christmas tree. He was still convulsing as he was handcuffed. I declined to press charges, but the DA charged him with assaulting a bailiff and causing a disturbance. He received three days off in jail and 200 hours of community service. From time to time, I see him in an orange vest, picking up trash on the side of the road. I always honk and wave at him. Her father came to see me. I heard there will be a wedding at the end of June. Is it true? Yes, I smiled. I would ask you for her hand, but I'm afraid it's too late. She already asked my mother for mine. Fine. I've always liked you, Jerry. You did a good job in a way I never would have thought possible. You would make an excellent politician. You would make an amazing club manager. It's a shame, isn't it? I was stunned. What exactly are we talking about here? He looked surprised. About your resignation, of course. My brother-in-law can't work here. It would be a conflict of interest. I wouldn't do that. So if I marry your daughter, I'll have to resign. I'm afraid so. Everything went down for me. This was my old dream. Maybe a stupid one, but a dream nonetheless. I shook myself. No job would ever cost Marie. I guess it's good that I'm marrying money. He stopped smiling. I will never allow my daughter to have a husband whom she must support. He paused, gauging my reaction. Besides, you have a job. With me. I have to look after the gold digger she married. I looked up in surprise. He had a huge smile on his face. I watched you, Jerry, as you moved up the career ladder. You never relaxed. You took on more than you could. You constantly found ways to make this club better. 
You paid for your degree and earned it without any help. You are probably the most moral person I know, and underneath your calm exterior lies a core of iron. You set a goal, set a deadline, and accomplished everything you set out to do. You can be proud of yourself, son. I know this is true. He leaned forward and we were almost nose to nose. I've built a good business, Jerry. Many people depend on me for their livelihood. This is a great responsibility. But I want you to learn this business. I will work you harder than anyone else. Start from the bottom and make you earn every promotion. And when you are ready, I will transfer it to you. In trust for my grandchildren and retire knowing that a reliable hand is at the helm. Can you handle this? I laughed, shaking his hand. I don't know, but I'm sure I'll find out. And so it was that on a sunny Saturday afternoon in June, Marie Patterson, she had reverted to her maiden name, became Mrs. Jerry Stone in the presence of almost all the members of the country club, my family and friends. Mom was especially happy. Evelyn hired her to help with mother of the bride duties, and just before walking down the aisle, Marie shared a secret with them both. I know it's my day, Mom, she said to my mother, but I want to give you a gift. She handed her an envelope with an invitation inside. Mom still keeps it. Birth announcement. Mr. and Mrs. Jerry Stone take great pleasure in announcing the birth on or about December 15th of a daughter-son, Constance Evelyn, my mom and her aunt, or John Edward, her dad and mine, Stone. The parents are pleased to announce that her nickname will be Dozen. Mom and Evelyn cried throughout the service. The pregnancy was a mutual decision, except that Marie stopped taking birth control and didn't tell me about it the day I gave her the ring. She told me this the night before the wedding. We both agreed that we wanted children. I'm already close to the danger zone in terms of age, and I want at least two, so they have to be close to each other. We simply cannot afford to waste time. So I was extremely happy for two reasons, watching her swim down the aisle. Sixteen months later, Johnny followed Connie. Marie announced the closure of the factory and tied the tubes. John worked with me like a dog, entrusting me with any dirty work, but I never complained and forbade Marie to do it. Seven years later, we had a big retirement party at the club, and the next week I watched as my name appeared on the door marked President. Mom loved to tell everyone that she had a devil's dozen when it came to grandchildren. She became very attached to Evelyn, and after her father died three years ago, she began to spend more and more time in our house, hanging out with her at the club while Mary and I worked. We bought a piece of land and built Marie her dream, child-friendly home. Four years later, I returned home to find heavy equipment parked on the far side of the property and Marie and Mom talking to a guy in a hard hat. I approached him. What are we building? Marie didn't even look up from the plans she was holding in her hands. Cottage for mother-in-law. For whom? She looked up from her papers with an indignant expression, and her mother pretended not to laugh. For my mother-in-law. Marie was the CEO of her own company and opened a third dealership in direct competition with her former one. After their divorce, Winnie the Pooh didn't have a very good life. They kicked him out of Briarwood Country Club for his little stunt of using my name in his business, which led to a confrontation. He joined another club three cities away. He learned a little from his mistakes, and wives number two and three signed prenuptial agreements, but still split up when his infidelity was discovered. Marie told me that he lives with a woman who is 17 years older than him. She is very rich, but refuses to marry him and keeps him on a short leash. I know what people say about me. I married money, slept with them to get to the top, that I am henpecked. I'm sure if Marie heard anything like that, she would quickly correct them. He's the sweetest person in the world, and he agrees with everything I say because it makes me happy and he really doesn't care. But when he says no, no means no, and I respect that. Either way, they don't say it to my face. Everyone who knows me, everyone who matters, knows the truth. To hell with everyone else. I like to think that I married the woman of my dreams and everything else is just a side benefit. Now I need to go to the club. I was elected to the board of directors. I know my father-in-law is still the chairman, nepotism rules. He admitted to me that he would soon leave there. 
he has finally found someone who he says is his late wife's equal. I'm pretty sure I'll like my new mother-in-law. I've known her for as long as I can remember. Marie laughs and says, We have a unique situation. My mother will simultaneously be my mother-in-law, and her adoptive mother will be hers. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you, and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.